kind of really define the two roles of project architect and project manager and what, you know, creating a project, what creating a project team looks like. Business of Architecture, episode 241. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I am Enix Sears, and I am your guide on this journey to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets of the world's most profitable and meaningful architectural practices. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared by going to freearchitectgift.com. If you haven't already seen that video, you are missing out. When you go there, you'll also be given a free subscription to my weekly Business of Architecture Insider, which you don't want to miss. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one solution for managing your architecture firm. From project management to accounting, time and expenses, billing, and business intelligence, Core makes all that easier. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Have you ever wanted to work for clients with a mission that you are passionate about? A mission that's making a difference in the world, that's having a real impact on the lives, the daily lives of mothers, of fathers, of children, of communities. Well, today we speak with an individual who is passionate about that kind of work, Christina Congdon. She is the project and operations manager of Environmental Works. Last week, we spoke with the executive director of Environmental Works, Roger Tucker. Now, in this episode, we get Christina's take on working for Environmental Works, which is a community design center, a nonprofit that helps underprivileged communities with affordable housing, with projects, getting their projects done. And you can listen to my interview with Roger Tucker for more specifics about what this particular organization does, how they structure their finances, and everything like that. So they're based in Seattle, Washington, and in this episode we talk about what inspired Christina to follow a career path in community design. And you can just hear in this interview her passion for what she's doing. It's it's totally contagious. As the operations manager, she also shares some insight about how she's handling the growing pains of a firm that is moving into a new stage of scale. Christina, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, first of all, I want to thank you specifically for reaching out. And I want to tell other people who are listening, if you think you might be a good guest or your firm might be good here on the Business of Architecture show, Christina showed that she is a proactive person by reaching out, telling me about her company and offering her uh, executive director, nicely enough, to be interviewed on the show. But we roped her into it as well. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised that you wanted me here, but... <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it, it'd be fantastic to get your perspective on the road that led you to this career path because we talk a lot about other firms that are for profit and kind of more traditional routes doing developer work or typical architecture work when we think about institutions. What led you down this path of working for environmental works? Yeah, so um, I went to grad school at University of Hawaii. And um, I got an architecture doctorate degree. Um, and for that doctorate, um, call it an RHD, um, you have to do like a big thesis project, um, like a year and a half or something. And um, my thesis project was on um, affordable housing in Hawaii specifically. Um, so I was looking at Hawaii and the need there. It's a huge need in Hawaii. Um, and I ended up moving back. Um, I grew up in Portland, but I ended up moving to Seattle um, after school, and um, I got a, a different job um, with another firm, worked there for about a year and a half, and during the economic downturn, um, I was actually um, sort of uh, working part-time at EW and still working at my other firm, so it was kind of like on a contract, like it was an agreement between the two firms because my firm that I was working with didn't have enough work and um, environmental works was like super busy at the time. So um, I made the decision at that time to come to environmental works because it was like meant to be. I felt like I was like, oh, I didn't even know that environmental work existed. It was um, exactly what I had envisioned doing, you know, when I was in Hawaii, like learning about affordable housing, I was like, I would love to work um, for, an organization that's doing good in the community um, and specifically working on affordable housing projects. So it kind of, I, I think I'm kind of unique because I've worked at Environmental Works for about 10 years now and I've only been out of school for um, about 12. So a majority of my time has been at Environmental Works because I feel like 
this is where I'm supposed to be, <laughs> you know, like it was meant to be. So it must be nice to have that certainty of feeling like you belong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so. I think it's, I have, um, I'm an operations manager, so I feel like I have like a vision of where, um, environmental works it can go in the future. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Tell me about the vision of the future. Where would you see it going? Well, I think, um, right now we're doing such a great job at, um, bringing in work. We have this like long standing relationship with our clients. Um, we have an abundance amount of work right now, like so much that um, we're trying to find people. <laughs> um, and uh, like, it's like, we, we need to find people. It's like kind of like at a crisis level um, in a way. Um, and so I, I think that we do a really good job at the architecture side. Um, me as an, just to speak candidly, I guess, me as an operations manager, I think we can do a lot better at more of the, um, the HR side. So kind of bringing in people, like looking at our benefits and um, really um, supporting um, the architecture uh, practitioner, like as a, as a whole person. Um, so, um, sorry, I don't know. I, I just feel like um, we have a lot of, we can, get our name out there more um, as um, to other architecture professionals and say, you know, we're here, we're doing great work, um, come work for us um, and, you know, have people see our great projects that we're working on. So I think we're kind of, um, we've always tend to be really kind of shy about the work that we do. And I would like us to push to be more out there in the world. And um, so people know that we're, what we're doing and um, be able to, gain the um, really top talent that um, I think we can get and do have, but, you know, get more of it. <laughs> so. so it sounds like the part of your vision you honed in on was attracting more talent yeah. to, the, to the firm. <laughs> yes, very much so. Yeah, that would, that's, um, you know, I think there's a shortage of um, sort of mid-level architects right now. Um, at least that's what it seems like here. Um, and so we're doing a lot of things to try and um, attract people, um, you know, looking at our benefits packages and offering um, uh, more exciting things to try and really get people here. And um, so I'm excited for that moving forward. What are your traditional ways of finding new staff? How do you market the, the company from a, uh, an HR standpoint? Yeah, so we um, do the traditional like Craigslist and AIA um, and, you know, there's all those Indeed and all those um, and we we have gotten very degrees of um, talent through that. Um, most recently, we actually hired a, um, a recruiter um, to help us um, and we have gotten one uh, employee now from that and um, it was was really great because they did all the work for us and found the people and vetted them and then um, we ended up getting an employee at the like right level that we're looking for because we tend to get like people that are you know 25 years and like one and we're like we need that sort of middle level <laughs> kind of that that in between state yeah. Yeah. When you look into the future at your vision of what environmental works could become, what else is a part of that vision after you start getting some more of these yeah. people who you would like to get? So um, I always say that um, I want environmental works to be the best place to work in all of Seattle or all of Washington. And I guess that means a varying degree of different things um, to different people. So um, I think just having a place that's, you know, supporting um, the growth of a professional um, and catering to the needs of, the, of different people. So, um, you know, paid family leave, um, uh, telecommuting opportunities, um, so, uh, flex work time, um, all of those things, I think, um, are things that really help people feel like they're working in an environment that's really um, catering to them. And um, so that's, I guess, what, what I see for the future um, and what we're kind of working on. There's um, 
this program called the Just Organization through the Living Future Institute. And it's kind of like LEAD, where you have this sort of scorecard of like, you have to meet certain criteria. Um, but this is just for organizations. So um, it's basically saying you're a socially responsible um, organization if you're able to meet these certain categories. Um, and so my goal is that we're going to meet that. I want to you know, meet and exceed that. Um, and so we're working on updating all of our policies and everything to try and achieve that goal to be just. So, What are some of the sustainable strategies or environmentally conscious things that you guys are really trying to do right now? Um, in terms of architecture or um, our organized like, operations? <laughs> well, if you have both, let's hear about both. I'm interested to know. <laughs> um, well, I think um, in terms of architecture, we are, um, I'm working on a project right now that's going to be one of the, hopefully, I think one of the first um, net zero um, supportive housing projects in Washington State. Um, so that's going to start construction really soon. Um, and so I think uh, working on that project and um, going through that process um, is going to inform us in future projects. So we're going to be able to use some of things we learned for that and uh, move forward for other projects. Um, in terms of Operations, I would say, um, uh, I think working on the social aspect of our organization is like at the top of our list right now. So some of the benefits that I've already listed like, um, for equitable, equitable practices, um, we've been trying to be more transparent in terms of um, our pay sales, you know, providing a really clear diagram of what you need to do to get to each level and sort of a pay range um, showing what you will be getting to try and um, minimizing the pay gap between men and women. Awesome. What, in, in your role as an operations manager, what goes into that? Um, so I just started this job um, for the last two years. So, and it's been kind of a new position for EW. We had one back um, before I was here, so more than 10 years ago. Um, and then um, I think maybe Roger got sick of me telling him all of my ideas. So he <laughs> was like, we're putting you into this role. I don't, I don't really know, but um, I get really passionate about talking about um, ideas for the future. So um, uh, basically, my responsibility is looking at project budgets, um, contracts. Um, I started with looking at our um, accounting and um, project management software and making sure that we're kind of getting up to date and utilizing that to the most, um, the most we can. Uh, we were kind of using it just for accounting and now we're starting to use it more for project management. Um, so I'm kind of managing that. Um, and then, so everything having to do with budget contracts um, policies, operational policies, um, and then the HR piece um, is something uh, that kind of ended up happening because we were discovering that we had all these operational policies in place, but we needed people. So it was really hard to actually execute our policies if we are hard, if we really need people. So I ended up kind of moving into a direction of looking at HR and hiring and what can we really do to get people in here so what project management software are you using uh ajira Del Del Tech, ajira yeah. uh, how's that working for you guys um i think it, i think it's good it's kind of challenging there's um i think the, the hardest thing about it is that the language with ajira and and the project managers are kind of don't really align. And so um, we're always having to explain to them that like, you know, Ajira doesn't want you to do it like you think in your mind as an architect it should in a way. Um, so we're trying to, so it's having to know that. And that's kind of like my role is kind of seeing that go between, between our accountants and um, our project managers and being like, well, you know, 
can't really do it that way, but we'll try and make it work for you type of thing. So, Do you have an example of one of those conflicts where the architects um, maybe want to do it some way? Um, so Azura has a limited amount of, um, of roles that you can have. Um, and, and it's kind of not working really well for the way that we're set up. So it's not, it's, it's not aligned with typical architecture. So it's like principal, uh, maybe project manager, uh, project architect, and then maybe even, you know, a designer or whatever. You may want to have all of those people having varying degrees of accessibility to the project. Um, but really, I think you can only have, um, you can only have one project manager like to view the dashboard and um, it just isn't as flexible in terms of that setup um, as I would like it to be. And I'd like it to be more like, you know, set up like this is how traditional practice is run. And so this, these are the people that you can put on it, you know, but yeah. Operationally, what would you say is one of your top one or two sticking points that kind of you you know just kind of a hassle <laughs> um yeah so i think it's really hard um change is really hard in the office in any place change is hard and so as an operations person who's all about my whole job is about instituting change um the hardest thing is bringing everybody along with me <laughs> um and being able to explain, you know, the reasons why we're changing and to get everybody on board in that process. Um, Environmental Works has always been, um, you know, smaller organization. Uh, always, you know, for a majority of the time that I've been here, it's been about 10 people. Um, within the last couple of years, we've, we're now at like 17 and we're expected to grow. And so um, we're starting to hit this point where we're not a small firm anymore. We can't really function like that. Um, we need to start moving into different practices um, for sort of more of a mid-sized type firm. And that kind of change, I think, is, is hard. So we're trying to navigate that right now. What are some specific examples of these changes <laughs> that you see that need to happen? Um, so <laughs> the project manager is going to kill me if they listen to this movie telling you all this stuff. So I think, um, you know, getting paperwork in, you know, we need to track things. It's just like really simple things like um, not, you know, before it was project managers kind of had their own system. They kind of operated um, more independently. Um, now we're kind of working on a system where it's, you know, we're one firm. You have to, you know, get all your paperwork into the accountant and, um, and file everything. And, you know, that kind of stuff is, is hard. Okay. So it sounds like the majority of it, what I'm hearing in Christina is the, a lot of the paperwork that might need to happen to make sure that systems are happening the way yeah. that they need to happen across the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it goes back to kind of a, a culture of bringing people along to the vision of where you need to go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what tools and resources have you found that have been helpful in you achieving that? Yeah, um, so we work with a um, organizational development consultant who has been a really great resource for me. And, um, you know, it's, she's always been somebody that, you know, if we need help, if we're stuck, we kind of go to that to her and she helps um, guide us in certain areas. So I think that would be like a, one of the main things um, for us. Awesome. Now I want to circle back to the, uh, a little bit of your background in this affordable housing and kind of get more into what's happening in that scene right now. What are you seeing in affordable housing? What are the big issues right now that you're really passionate about? I see big issues. Um, oh. Well, let's see. Well, I, I think I've mentioned the um, net zero project that we're working on. So I get really passionate when we're talking about kind of cutting edge um, technologies and systems um, when we're kind of pushing the envelope for affordable housing. Um, 
So doing things that haven't been done before, like being at zero or, you know, like my ultimate goal would, I would love for us to do a living building for affordable housing. Um, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's being, has been done yet, but I'd love for that to happen, see that happen. Um, and I think also how we are working on doing more community-based projects. So um, working with the residents and getting that input and um, learning from their experience on how to design a unit, you know, like those like specific things of working with the people and having them tell us what works and what doesn't. Any insights that you care to share that you've gotten from working on some of these projects from working with these stakeholders? Yeah, so um, there has been a couple of um, community participatory um, charrettes that we've done. And, um, you know, it varies from different cultures. Um, one culture, um, you know, they didn't like the way that the kitchen was organized. They wanted it to be, we were assuming sort of a, an open kitchen concept. And their culture really wanted it to be more closed or have the opportunity to have it be more closed. So that drastically changed the way we designed the unit. And then also like thinking about, we were assuming, you know, you, you organize units and you assume, oh, the kitchen needs to be um, toward the play area outside um, because, you know, the woman would be cooking and wanting to oversee the children. But actually this culture had it the opposite way where the men in the living room would be looking at the um, kids playing while the, the mom cooked, you know, um, that's the, the best example I can think of, but really specific things like that we find out all the time. Yeah, that, that's a great example of just culturally different design practices, how it can vary just by culture even. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Christina, we, we touched on, so we touched on a bit of your background. We touched on the projects that Environmental Works was doing in our conversation with Roger. Uh, we touched on some of the growing pains that are happening as you're looking to move past 17. You're very stretched right now, you said, in terms of a lot of work, not enough staff, and then some growing pains in terms of those project managers got to make sure they put in their form. So if you're listening, <laughs> Enoch said, get those papers in. Uh, are, is there any other things that have been a bit of a hassle or a bit of a kind of those growing pains as you've, as you've been kind of? Yeah. Banning? So one thing that we're trying to figure out right now is, um, uh, so in Seattle, a lot of the funding for affordable housing is moving toward larger projects, so more like 100 plus units. Um, we've traditionally been more in the 50-60 range, and so we're, we have projects now in the office that are um, 100 plus and 200. And um, so uh, not only are we making the jump from size of firm, but also project type. And so... Um, operationally, that's been, we've been looking at that and trying to figure out how that changes our office structure, so, and team structure. Um, so, you know, typically, team structure is principal, project architect, or project manager, and then maybe some production staff. Now, with bigger projects, you know, we're looking at having a project architect and a project manager, um, and a multiple amounts of production staff and having that team stay on the project for, you know, a couple of years, that's a big change from having a couple of people working on a project and being able to work on a couple of other, other projects at the same time. So we're trying to figure out how to, um, how to really define the two roles of project architect and project manager. Um, and, um, and what, you know, creating a project, what a, creating a project team looks like and looking far enough at our workload to be able to keep that project team long term. And what solutions have you been coming up with to deal with that <laughs> challenge? This is a brand new thing. So if anybody has ideas about this, we would love to know. <laughs> so, Reach out. Yeah. Well, Christina, what, tell me one last question. Just what are you really excited about right now? Um, I am really excited about the future of environmental works. Um, there's, 
um, a lot of change happening and um, we're moving forward and um, uh, evolving into um, something really awesome. So that's, that's exciting. Now, before, before I let you go, since you are looking for talent, give me a snapshot of what it might be like to work at Environmental Works. Why would someone want to work there? Maybe someone's listening who's considering it. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, we have a lot of awesome projects. The projects that we work on are so meaningful. So if you're um, working on something that you feel like there's got to be more to architecture, where you know you don't want to work on Costco's or something like that, you just feel like there's no meaning. Um, Environmental Works has a bunch of projects with a lot of great clients. So our clients um, are really great to work with. Um, you know, the, most often we work with developers or nonprofit developers, and so they're really great because everybody sort of has the same mission of wanting to do great work. Um, and then just, you know, everybody at um, Environmental Works is passionate about what we do and um, really fun to work with. So. <laughs> Christina, how could someone, what's the best way to get a hold of you if someone's interested in finding out more? Yeah, you can go to our website at www.eworks.org and it has information about um, everything you need to know about us. So that would be good. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. Yeah. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.